What's up, guys? I'm back with another in this series of close reading great articles. I made a list of my favorite articles I've ever read, at least that I remembered. The ones that really, like, shape my thinking about the world and, and you know, how it works and how we fit into it. Uh, and now I'm going through them one by one and doing, like, a really close reading of them. Looking up anything, you know, may not know about or just getting background on things. Making sure we understand everything that's going on in these amazing articles so that we can get, like, a, a really rich you know, sort of starting point for when we start going through the news and, and uh, you know, I'm trying to understand it and evaluate it and all that, we can kind of have this like background base level information already kind of, you know, established and in the record to refer back to. So today we've got uh, 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 one of my favorite articles, uh, appropriately enough. This is called How Democrats Killed Their Populist Soul in the 1970s, a new wave of post-Watergate liberals stopped fighting monopoly power. The result is an increasingly dangerous political system. It's by a man named Matt Stoller, who is one of my favorite writers. I know I keep saying that, but there's a reason, you know, these articles are on the list. Uh, Matt Stoller is a guy, he works at a think tank. It's like the Open Markets Institute, I think. Uh, yeah, the Open Markets Institute, he works at this think tank, he, you know, the Open Markets Institute, what they write about is sort of competition policy and anti-monopoly, uh, you know, stuff. So that's kind of his focus is, is on that sort of thing. I saw uh, in a Reddit thread once, and I totally forget the context, but I saw in a Reddit thread once, someone had posted a, a, a take by somebody, I forget who, and someone else said, man, is there anyone with a, a, as equally balanced uh, a portfolio of like good and awful takes as whoever that person was. And someone responded, Matt Stoller, and I was like, you know what, fair, fair play, man. Matt Stoller, there's a lot of stuff I really disagree with him about. A lot of stuff I think he's kind of wacky about, but my God, does he does he write some great stuff a lot of the time also. Uh, we might we might do a second article from him down the road a little way. It'll depend on how long I keep this, this series going for, but he's got another great one about how Alexander Hamilton was actually a terrible person and uh, how, like, the, the, the rehabilitation of Hamilton is a good sign that, that uh, society is kind of veering off track. It's not the first time it's happened, uh, you know, with the play a little while ago. But anyways, Matt Stoller, uh, you know, writes about competition policy and, and anti-monopoly stuff. He wrote this article on October 24th, 2016. So right before the, the 2016 election. I think the Comey letter was the 28th. I think, yeah, October 28th. So October 28th is when James Comey sent, you know, the, I, I forget honestly what the letter said, but it's the thing that like a lot of people think was like the final straw that tipped the election to Trump and, and you know, <laughs> did all that. Uh, but so the point is that you got to keep in mind that he's writing this article in a, in a moment when everyone is expecting Hillary Clinton to win the election, right? Where it's just like conventional wisdom. Everyone knows Hillary's going to win. We're going to go from Barack Obama to Bill, to Hillary Clinton to Michelle Obama to Chelsea Clinton. To, we're just going to have this like endless regime of, you know, these neoliberal uh presidents then you know this was you, you also got to keep in mind this was at a point when when people were talking about if we were seeing the end of the republican party as we know it right like everyone's like, like oh well they're gonna get crushed in 2016 and you know demographics is destiny and and there were people you know asking like very serious thinkers asking questions like will we ever see a republican president or republican majority again like this was a time when it seemed like you know the 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 forward march of the democratic Democratic Party was inevitable, and that it was almost like an end of history moment uh, to, you know, throw back to Francis from, from the last video, where it was like, okay, well, we've established that the liberals are, like, the good guys, and the Republicans have gone off to crazy town, and we don't have to worry about them anymore, so I think he very much wrote this with that perspective, right, of like, okay, well, if we're gonna live under Democrat rule forever, we gotta, you know, look a little you know, we got to question the, the democrat philosophy right and and uh it was also 
It was also an election that was, you know, the, the other storyline before we got to, to, you know, all the Trump business, the other storyline was the Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton primary, right? Where we see this, this schism within the Democratic primary between the, 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 you know, radical left, the populists, the progressives, and the sort of neoliberal right, the center, wherever you want to put them. Uh, it represented by Hillary Clinton, and it reveals that there, there is, there really is, you know, the Democrats are not this like ideologically coherent party. They are, you know, a fairly large tent that encompasses both these these wildly progressive people like Bernie Sanders and these, you know, not people <laughs> like Hillary Clinton. And so that that is very much what this article is about right here. And so the, you know, again, to take the title, the title, how Democrats killed their populist soul. Uh, this is this is the story of how you know the 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 pendulum swung from a very populist Democratic Party to this very neoliberal technocratic uh, you know diversity focused but but also pro business Democratic Party that that we see today. So I'm gonna break this article up into a lot of parts. It's fairly long. I think it's gonna be like five or six parts. I forget exactly how many sections there are, but I'm gonna take it a section at a time. Hopefully keep these videos from getting too too long. So, uh, for today, we're just going to be going through the intro right here, but, uh, I'm probably going to put all these videos up at once. I, I, I've been waiting to finish this one so I can put up the first three all together. So hopefully you won't have to actually wait for the subsequent parts of it. So anyways, let's get started here with, uh, how Democrats killed their populist soul. It was January 1975, and the Watergate babies had arrived in Washington looking for blood. The Watergate babies, as the recently elected Democratic congressmen were known, were young, idealistic liberals who'd been swept into office on a promise to clean up government, end the war in Vietnam, and rid the nation's capital of the kind of corruption and dirty politics the Nixon White House had wrought. Richard Nixon himself had just resigned a few months earlier in August, but the Water ba ba Watergate babies didn't just campaign against Nixon. They took on the Democratic establishment too. Newly elected, newly elected Representative George Miller of California, then just 29 years old, announced, We came here to take the Bastille. So let's, let's situate ourselves here, right? Because our story is going to start in 1975. So... Watergate, I think the Watergate break-in is 72. Let's just, can I put, yeah, yeah, date 1972. So June 1972 is the Watergate break-in. And then he said Nixon resigned just in August. I think it's August 9th. August 9th, 1974. Yeah, so, and then also the Vietnam War. We got to get the Vietnam War in there just for, for sort of context. Vietnam War is 1955 to April 30th, 1975. So that's like the scene in, the, in this moment right here, right? Is, is we've had the Vietnam War going on for 20 years and there's only four months left in it. We've had Watergate, that whole scandal has been playing out for two and a half years and it has like just come to this head with Nixon resigning. That is the world we are stepping into where, where those are like the major stories. And of course, you know, you've got like the, the 60s, the, the, the student movements and the, the civil rights movement and all of that sort of breaking as it hits the 70s. And, and like this is, this is the world we are stepping into with these Watergate babies. Uh, so just keep that, you know, context in, in, in your mind right there. We go back to the story. One of their first targets was an old man from Texarkana, a former cotton tenant farmer named Wright Patman, who had served in Congress since 1929. He was also the chairman of the U.S. House Committee on Banking and Currency and had been for more than a decade. Anti-war liberal reformers recognized that the key to power in Congress was through the committee system. Being the chairman of a powerful committee meant having control over the flow of legislation. The problem was, chairmen were selected based on their length of service, so liberal reformers already in office, buttressed by the Watergate babies' votes, demanded that the committee chairman be picked by a full Democratic caucus vote instead. So you've got you've got all these guys showing up, right? These these new Watergate babies coming in, and they want to make like major change, right? They're not just trying to like nibble around the edges or just like you know sit back and, and learn the ropes for a little bit. They are trying to, to shake shit up. They came to take the Bastille, right? 
problem is that you know congress is a very conservative institution it is not it is designed exactly to stymie those impulses and so what they butt up against is this problem that that the people who really run congress the committee chairs who sort of you know decide what legislation lives and dies decide what inquiries get handled and how and and set all the rules for all those things the people who actually hold the power that's handed out based on you know who's been around longest based on seniority so what they do here is they switch it so instead of just being whoever's been around longest it's voted on by the full democratic caucus instead the the chairman are are picked by all of the democratic congress people so that's the one thing we got going on in this uh, paragraph the other thing is we've met this character wright patman who is going to be a, a major player in in this story here so let's look a little deeper into him wright patman they, he's we just you know a former cotton tenant farmer what exactly tenant farmer what exactly does that mean i mean that means who farms rented land right right so it's not like he owns you know a, a whole lot of property and farmed it he was just sort of like a hired farmer uh on on someone else's land so not a particularly well-off guy right someone who comes from very like you know uh working class probably you could probably call him poor I, I don't know i'm not making a judgment on the man i haven't seen seen his lifestyle or anything but you could say he's not he's not a well-off man uh he was born in 1893 so that puts him like a generation after the generation right after the civil war right so the civil war ends in 65 then you got a generation so the kids of the kids his grandparents would have been the people fighting in the civil war probably uh it was a u.s congressman from texas in the first congressional district which is on the border with louisiana over there looks like it's it's pretty rural i think i can see you guys probably can't make out here but basically dallas is is like a couple counties or whatever these these little things are over from his district so he's representing a really rural district in uh you know the eastern texas i've driven through here a lot i, I used to live in in austin down here uh, can i make this bigger i feel like i could probably make this bigger for you guys i just want to open it i just okay no um yeah so uh, and still don't know if you guys can see this but austin down here basically i used to drive uh, through a part you know a little south of his district a lot and you know down over there it's like all oil refineries and, and you know that sort of thing so in you know we're talking about 1929 uh, i guess it's uh, yeah till 1975 apparently you know, oh and chair of the united states house committee on banking currency to 1975 so yeah through through that period, we're probably not, you know, there's probably not a huge oil industry there yet. Certainly not in 1929. So we're talking about a really rural, you know, uh, district. He's representing a lot of like farmers and, and you know, what have you. Not well off people. Real salt of the earth types is, is this guy's constituency. Um, so yeah, Patman was a fiscal watchdog who acted to protect American wage earners by identifying and preventing the excesses and unfair practices of the banks and the Federal Reserve. He sponsors the Robinson Patman Act of 1935, which was designed to protect small retail shops against competition from chain stores by fixing a minimum price for retail products. Uh, let's just real quickly look into his early life here. Uh, born near Hughes Springs in Cass County, Texas, 19, 1893, graduated from some high school, went to law school in Lebanon, Tennessee, which uh, I've never heard of before. Receiving his law degree in 1916, he was admitted to the Texas Bar the same year. During World War I, Patman enlisted in the U.S. Army as a private, so he, he goes to law school in 1912, gets out, goes to World War I, you know, for America's little expedition into the end of it. Uh, and then gets a commission as a first lieutenant and machine gun officer in the Texas Army National Guard's 144th Infantry Regiment, Unit 36 Division. He remained in the National Guard for several years after the war. So he goes to, he goes to World War I, comes back, joins the Texas National Guard. Uh, that must be 1917, probably. So he's in the, the National Guard for several years. No, I guess for just for a few years, because he was elected to the Texas House of Representatives in 1920, left the House in 1924, and became District Attorney of the 5th Judicial District of Texas. And then in 1928, gets elected to the House of Representatives in Texas 1st District. 
Uh, and then we're going to talk about what comes next is, is where we're going to pick up his, his story over in this article over here. So that's right, Patman. Let's just real quick get this, pull this uh, picture of him up just so you guys can have him in your head. A nice, homely looking fellow. Just looks like straight out of like a Frank Capra movie. Like, I feel like this guy was like one of the bank employees at, uh, in, you know, uh, it's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. I feel like he like works at, he's like the old guy at the bank everyone loves. Like just a classic old dude right there. So, all right, so that's right, Patman. Ironically, as chairman of the banking committee, Patman had been the first Democrat to investigate the Watergate scandal, but he was vulnerable to the new crowd he had helped usher in. He was old, they were young. He had supported segregation in the past and the war in Vietnam. They were vehemently against both. Patman had never gone to college and had been a crusading economic populist during the Great Depression. The Watergate babies were weaned on campus politics, television, and affluence. And this right here is like the, 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 the core of the thing we're going to be talking about, right? Not so much old and young, and, and, but, you know, supported segregation, supported the war in Vietnam, but was also, you know, this crusading economic populist during the Great Depression from this, like, really, you know, lower class, middle class, maybe background uh, representing, you know, people just like that, uh, you know, as opposed to people who were really against segregation, really against Vietnam, and, you know, who were weaned on campus politics, television, and affluence. So this is the conflict we're setting up right here is, is these two groups of people. What's more, the new members were anti-war, not necessarily anti-bank. Our generation did not know the Great, Depre Great Depression, then Representative Paul Tsongas said. The populism of the 1930s doesn't really apply to the 1970s, argued Pete Stark, a California member who launched his political career by affixing a giant peace sign onto the roof of the bank he owned. Uh, so yeah, let's just real quick, uh, I think both of these guys are going to come back up, so let's just, you know, check them out. Paul Tsongas, American politician from Massachusetts in, uh, Congress, in both houses of the U.S. Congress, who so was in, you know, House of Representatives and Senate, from 1975 to 1985, and was actually a candidate in the 892 presidential Democratic primaries and lost to Bill Clinton. Uh, so here's this guy that, yeah, you know, like, I, I, like if you told me 1970, and I love these guys that just look exactly like they're supposed to 1975 congressman from Massachusetts, all of them looked exactly like this. Just like with a, with a fucking stamp, they just stamped him out and, and then sent him off to work. Um, oh, he got Lon Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1983 and didn't, I mean, well, he came back and ran for president. So I guess it must've gone pretty well. So yeah, from Lowell, Massachusetts working class family who came to own a very successful dry cleaning business in Lowell, uh, Greek, son of a Greek immigrant and a Greek woman who I guess wasn't an immigrant, went to Dartmouth, then Yale Law, then JFK uh, School of Government at Harvard, and then he settles down in, in Lowell, Massachusetts again. Uh, so yeah, very elite education on this guy. Went to the Peace Corps uh, from 62 to 64, or no, from 62 to 68. So yeah, so that's that's this guy, and then Pete Stark, that's Paul Tsongas. Pete Stark's another dude we're going to talk about a little bit. Uh, he is, let's see, an American businessman and politician. He was a House of Representatives from 73 to 2013 from California. Um, Stark's district, California's 13th was in southwestern Alameda County and included Alameda, Union City, Hayward, Newark, San Leandro, San Lorenzo, and Fremont. Okay. As well as parts of Oakland and Pleasanton. So sort of, that must be like kind of north, but not quite, not very north, like just south of San Francisco. Yeah, so if you can see it on the map here, just south of San Francisco, kind of central, north of central California. Uh, probably, again, you know, fairly rural, but also, you know, just outside of San Francisco, right? Uh, let's see. He was in Congress for a very long time until 2013. He was the fifth most senior representative and sixth most senior member of Congress overall. Uh, where's he come from? Born in Milwaukee of German and Swiss descent, so very white. Uh, got a Bachelor of Science at MIT. Then he went to the Air Force from 55 to 57. He probably bombed some, uh, some Vietnamese people. 
Uh, and then he went to UC Berkeley and uh, got an MBA in 1960. And he got bought a house in Anne Arundel County, Maryland in 88. That sounds a lot. That's that We jumped ahead a little bit there. Uh, in 1963, Pete Stark founded Security National Bank, a small bank in Walnut Creek. Within 10 years, it grew to a wealthy company, a wealthy company with branches across Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Grew up a Republican, uh, but his opposition to the Vietnam War led him to switch parties in the mid-60s. He printed checks with peace signs on them and placed a giant peace sign on the roof of his bank's headquarters. And in 71, he was elected to the Common Cause National Governing Board. So, yeah, so a lot of elite education here, a lot of successful business. Uh, yeah, so these are the guys we're looking at. And, and yeah, I mean, this guy that, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> he, he just looks like... He looks like the dad in a comedy that's about, like, a, a, a rebellious daughter, maybe. And he, he's just, like, kind of distraught, but also really loving and supportive. That's that's the vibe I get from this guy. So that's our friend Pete Stark, who, uh, you know, launched his political career by affixing a giant peace sign onto the roof of the bank he owned. In reality, while the Watergate babies provided the numbers needed to eject him, it was actually Patman's banking committee colleagues who orchestrated his ouster. For more than a decade, Patman had represented a democratic political tradition stretching back to Thomas Jefferson, an alliance of the agrarian South and the West against Northeastern capital. For decades, excuse me, Patman had sought to hold financial power in check investigating corporate monopolies, high interest rates, the Federal Reserve, and big banks. And the banking allies on the committee had had enough of Patman's hostility to Wall Street. So you can see that even before our story starts, right, the, the seeds have already been planted in that, you know, the banking industry has all these allies on the banking committee in Congress, and they're able to oust this, like, really anti- you know, I, I don't know if it's fair to call him anti-bank guy, but, you know, he's he represents uh, an alliance of the agrarian South and the West against Northeastern capital. He represents the control of banks as opposed to control by banks. And so the, you know, the, the, the people that the banks had supporting them in on the banking committee and in Congress and these new Democrats... Uh, the Watergate babies who just wanted to, you know, take, take, get, like, shake things up a bunch. They end up kicking out this guy, right, Patman. Over the years, Patman had upset these members by blocking bank mergers and going after financial power. As famed muckraking columnist Drew Pearson put it, Patman committed one cardinal sin as chairman. He wants to investigate the big bankers. And so it was the older bank allies who and so it was the older bank allies who truly ensured that Patman would go down. In 1975, these bank-friendly Democrats spread the rumor that Patman was an autocratic chairman biased against junior congressmen. To new members eager to participate in policymaking, this was a searing indictment. The campaign to oust Patman was brief and savage. Michigan's Bob Carr, a member of the 1975 class, told me the main charge against Patman was that he was an incompetent chairman, a charge with, with which the nonprofit Common Cause agreed. And that's the thing. Didn't we just find out that, that uh, Pete Stark was, was a, a big deal over there? Wait, that's not what I wanted. I wanted... I wanted to come back to Pete Stark. Yeah, he was elected to the Common Cause National Governing Board in 1971. Uh, and then now this this common cause organization, where'd that go? Oh, I, I scrolled up a whole bunch. Um, so, yeah, 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 that he was an incompetent chairman and that's common cause is backing them up on that. One of the revolt's leaders, Edward Pattison, actually felt warmly towards Patman and his legendary populist career, but there was just a feeling that he had lost control of his committee. Not all on the left were swayed. Barbara Jordan, the renowned representative from Texas, spoke eloquently in Patman's defense. Ralph Nader raged at the betrayal of a warrior against corporate power. And California's Henry Waxman, one of the few populist Watergate babies, broke with his class, puzzled by all the liberals who opposed Patman's chairmanship. Still, Patman was crushed. Of the three chairmen who fell, Patman lost by the biggest margin. 
A week later, the bank-friendly members of the committee completed their takeover, uh, and Leonore Sullivan, a Missouri populist, the only woman on the banking committee, and the author of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, was removed from her position as the subcommittee chair in revenge for her support of Patman. A revolution has occurred, noted the Washington Post. So we've got all these guys who are, who are like, you know, old school cru populist crusaders, Barbara Jordan, Ralph Nader. Uh, let's just... Uh, we don't need to go to all these guys. This is the only appearance they're going to make. But Barbara Jordan, if you don't know Barbara Jordan, you should learn about her. She's she's a, a, a wonderful figure in American history. And Ralph Nader, you must know Ralph Nader. Unless you're, you know, too young to remember the, the 2000 election, I guess. But Ralph Nader, a, a famous consumer advocate and, and sort of anti-corporate, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what to call him. Legend. So these guys are backing up Wright Patman, right? And who's, who is this Henry Waxman character? Why is he one of the few populist Watergate babies? What? I mean, I'm just curious. Is he going to be interesting looking fellow? Um, so California's 33rd congressional district. That looked like it was around LA. Yeah, so this is, this is, God, congressional districts are so ridiculous looking. Look at this gerrymandering right here. Look at this. That's like... How is that a congressional district? <laughs> Anyways, I think we got Los Angeles down here and then, you know, the, the sort of the coast going north from Los Angeles. So that's where that guy's from. And then, you know, a bunch of other random shit too. Uh, it's just to conclude much of the western part of the city of Los Angeles as well as West Hollywood, Santa Monica, and Beverly Hills. So from a pretty affluent part of the world. Uh, he now serves as chairman of Waxman Strategies. Was considered to be one of the most influential liberal members of Congress and was instrumental in passing laws including the Infant Formula Act of 1980, the Orphan Drug Act of 1980. All right, we just got a long list of bills he passed that none of them look like things I've ever heard of before. Served as the chairman of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, 2007 to 2009. Energy and Commerce, 2009 to 2011. Where does he come from? Born in L.A., uh, the son of Esther and Ralph Louis Waxman. His father was born in Montreal. His mother's from Pennsylvania. All of his grandparents were Jewish immigrants from Russia. When's he born? When's he born? This is just in office. When's he born? When was the man born? <laughs> there we go. 1939. So, uh, so not like freeing the, fleeing the Holocaust or anything. They're from well before then. Um, Went to UCLA, got a bachelor's degree in political science in 61, then a, a JD from UCLA Law in 64, worked as a lawyer, went, elected to the California Assembly in 69, served three terms, uh, and founded the Los Angeles C County Young Democrats. So, nothing in his background that really stands out, but, you know, grandkid of Jewish immigrants, uh, born in LA. I don't know, interesting, look interesting looking dude, for sure. Uh, yeah, okay, so, you know, not everybody wanted to get Wright Patman out, the, the old school leftists supported him, but the, all the new Watergate babies and, and all the people who, you know, were, were cozied up to the banks kicked him out anyways. Indeed, a revolution had occurred, but the contours of that revolution would not be clear for decades. In 1974, young liberals did not perceive financial power as a threat, having grown up in a world where, big, where banks and big business were largely kept under control. It was the government, through Vietnam, Nixon, and executive power, that organized the political spectrum. By 1975, liberalism meant, as Carr put it, where you were on issues like civil rights and the war in Vietnam, with the exception of a few new members like Miller and Waxman, suspicion of finance as a part of liberalism had vanished. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's important to, to I, I think we're going to, now I'm going to hold off on that because I think there's a, a better place to talk about that. But basically, you know, we think today of, of kind of the question is like big government or big business, right? Like, do you want, do you want to, uh, are, are you, uh, or, or do you want to, you know, make business huge and, or sorry, government huge and redistribute wealth and give it all kinds of power? Or do you want 
business to do those things and in this world they're stepping into you know it's pretty economically stable right america is enjoying the the amazing boon of of post-war just development where we get to rebuild the whole broken world and you know like we're pretty much the only power left that that has any like you know stability and strength so the economy's doing great and you know Business is, has been kept in check by these these populist New Deal Democrats who've held power for a long time, and what what people see is not that you know the the scary oppressiveness of of business, and and they're not worried about keeping business in check. They're worried about government. They've got you know the Vietnam War is like the front and center issue, and that is obviously a tale of gov huge government gone wrong. And then Nixon, you know, and and like Watergate and, and all of those scandals. So everyone is seeing government in this really you know. Uh, scary lens and business in this like pretty positive lens right like you know business doing great government doing awful of course we're gonna lean a little more towards business over the next 40 years this democratic generation fundamentally altered american politics this would be the watergate babies they're talking about they restructured campaign finance party nominations government transparency and congressional organization they took on domestic violence, homophobia, discrimination against the disabled, and sexual harassment. They jettisoned, they jettisoned many racially and culturally authoritarian traditions. They produced Bill Clinton's presidency directly, and in many ways, they shaped President Barack Obama. So, important to keep in mind and to point out, like, not bad things necessarily on this list. Transparency, taking on domestic violence, homophobia, discrimination against the disabled, sexual harassment, a lot of really great cultural projects that these people did and a lot of real good came out of it but also notice that nowhere on there do you see sort of you know economic inequality or or you know monopoly power or or business regulation of business or pollution or the environment or anything like that it's a very uneconomic platform we're looking at here and it's very much much more social much more cultural much more you know identity based and much less economic and class based the result today is a paradox at the same time that the nation has achieved perhaps the most tolerant culture in u.s history the destruction of the anti-monopoly and anti-bank tradition in the democratic party has also cleared the way for the greatest concentration of economic power in a century this is not what the Watergate babies intended when they dethroned patman as chairman of the banking committee but it helped lead them down that path the story of Patman's ousting is part of the larger story of how the Democratic Party helped to create today's shockingly disillusioned and sullen public, a large chunk of whom is now marching for Donald Trump. So again, this is the story we're looking at here is, you know, they, they turn away from all this economic stuff because to them, the economy is taking care of itself. And instead, they fixate on the cultural and, and you know, more uh, like government keeping government in check stuff that is not going well you know this is we've we've had the civil rights movement sure the civil rights act was uh, 64 65 right so so you know it's not like we're in the throes of the worst of it but we're still in you know the the aftershocks of it and obviously it's not like you know racial issues just went away in 1965 so you know that is what these guys are focused on not keeping private power in check but keeping public power in check and as he points out here, you know, they weren't setting out to create the most, uh, you know, the greatest concentration of economic power in a century. They weren't setting out to, you know, uh, uh, like fuck up basically all of the class progress made by the New Deal and, and in the wake of the Great Depression and all that. But they might have done it anyways. <laughs> and, you know, of course... Now, again, he wrote this is now marching for Donald Trump back when everyone was thinking that Donald Trump wasn't getting elected. So this this line echoes a little bit louder now, you know, seeing where we are. And it also, you know, when he was writing this, we were looking forward to a, just a sort of constant march of cultural progress, right? When he was writing this, everyone just assumed, okay, well, you know, things are going to keep getting better for minorities. Things are going to keep getting more equal based on you know like identity groupings and things like that and uh now it looks a whole lot different right now it looks like may we're seeing a strong backlash to all of this this cultural progress 
and you know it really cast these guys in a much worse light given that they they threw out all the economic progress and in you know for this really great cultural progress that may not have been quite as sticky and as permanent as they thought it was so i'm going to stop this video right here we'll get to the next section in the next one so i hope you guys have enjoyed it hope you stick around for the next one i'll see you there in just a minute or something i don't know take it easy guys see you in a little bit